As large democracies become modern digital states, they'll get inspiration from their smallest allies. That is the premise for today's conversation. Welcome to Exponential. AI is not only changing how we live, it's also forcing governments to reinvent themselves, to become digital natives. How can large nations like the US enter the future without becoming vulnerable to the digital downsides of cyber attacks and polarization? Estonia is a tiny ex-Soviet republic that has successfully turned to the West, joining the EU, NATO and the World Trade Organization. The country is voraciously digital, the first to offer nationwide online voting, and nearly every government service is on the web. Yet all of this from a nation which only restored its independence from the Soviet Empire in 1991. They've managed to do it with a tiny population, 1.3 million, that's about the same as San Diego. And they suffered the first national cyber attack way back in 2007. And despite this, or perhaps because of it, Estonia is really taking advantage of AI. What can other countries learn about managing this digital transition? I came to the capital Tallinn to discuss this with Kaya Kallas, the recently re-elected Prime Minister. It's remarkable because just a little over 30 years ago, you know, Estonia was under Soviet oppression and Estonia's own journey has been an exponential one in just three decades. I'm very curious to learn from you initially how distant or close to those times of Soviet rule and rule from Moscow feel to you today? Well, they feel distant, uh, but at the same time, uh, not so distant. I was born under Soviet occupation. Uh, then we restored our independence and seeing the development uh, in our economy. I mean, our uh, you know, GDP has risen by 3.5 uh, times mm. uh, over these times and our salaries have risen uh, 45 times wow. uh, compared to the beginning. So it has been a remarkable uh, journey, uh, but we are a small country and of course we had to build everything from scratch uh, wow. because you know so many things that the Soviet occupation um, normalized for example like corruption and so we had to start from zero or even sub-zero. It's interesting that you use the word Soviet occupation about the 50-year period that Estonia was part of the USSR because of course it's so close to Finland it's a 20-minute plane ride uh, I guess you must have had access to Finnish media yeah. growing up as, as well, in a way perhaps that other Soviet republics didn't, couldn't access it. Aspects no, uh, of the West. Yeah, this is true, but we never uh, fit under that occupation. Right. So it is belonging to the Western world and was also uh, why all the Russians wanted to uh, come to Estonia during that time. And, and you know, in the 1920s, our Russian population was about 3.2%, uh, uh, but as they deported Estonians and brought in Russians, uh, after or in the end of Soviet occupation, it was 30%. Right. And your, your family was affected with the, the deportations. I think some yeah. members of your family were deported by Stalin. At, at yeah, Hitler. this is uh, not a unique story uh, in Estonia. I mean, every family has a story like this. Uh, uh, my family, my mother was only six months old baby uh, when she was deported to Siberia in a cattle wagon with my grandmother and great grandmother while my uh, grandfather was sent to prison camp. But we are sitting here in the state elders room and the pictures you see on those walls are of our political elite of uh, right. 1920s. And if you look at their dates of death, they were all uh, killed or died in captivity when the occupation started. In fact, some of the, 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 the death dates are with question marks because... Yeah, uh, you don't know. You, we don't know. We don't know when that, when that happened. Mm. And there might have been some resentment. And yet you manage to have a country that doesn't seem to have, even now, a lot of ethnic conflagration between these between these two groups. And I say even now, of course, because we're sitting more than a year into uh, Russia's illegal invasion 
of Ukraine. As we say here, we might have a different past with our Russian-speaking minority, but we have a common future. Our Russian-speaking minority, especially those who are living closer to Russia, they can see that life on the Russian side is so much worse than it is on the Estonian side. So they are clearly with us and they understand what is going on in Ukraine. And what we are seeing in Ukraine unfolding is the same uh, atrocities that our grandparents uh, uh, went through. Yes. And that is why it is so black and white. And the sufferings uh, that our grandparents went through, we want to avoid those uh, for anybody else. Did you hear the stories from your grandmother Absolutely. and from your mother yeah. as you were growing up? Uh, yes, of course, we heard the stories. But on the positive side, I must say that when we celebrated our 30th anniversary of uh, restoring our independence, mm -hmm. then uh, I, as a prime minister, asked the uh, young people to write me essays about those uh, times when we restored our independence. And that, while I was reading those essays, what struck me was that uh, our young people nowadays are exactly the same as the German or the French young people because right. they take freedom for granted. And for me, I mean, I'm of the lucky generation that didn't have freedom and has the freedom now, so I'm not taking this for granted. Yeah. The phrasing you use there, though, you're, you're in the lucky generation who it's, didn't take freedom yes. for granted. My grandparents, they had everything. They had the freedom to move, they had the freedom of choice, and everything was taken from them. And I was born on the Soviet occupation. We didn't have any choice. We couldn't go to a foreign country. And now we have, uh, we have all that. Right. But I was happy to read their essays to understand that we have done something right because they don't have the fears that yeah. my generation has who remembers that it can all fall apart again. I suppose maybe it's, a, uh, it's a, an unvarnished opinion from me, but I picture Estonia and Estonian society is more resilient than the UK or the US is. And I, and I wonder whether I build that picture because of your proximity to Russia, because in 2007, you were the first country to suffer a, a sovereign cyber attack. Uh, you're largely believed to have emanated from Moscow. It is clear that uh, that we were attacked in 2007, and and uh, we, after that, concentrated on re I mean, building our resilience. Uh, and but the it was foundation. a cyber attack, right? So it, it was wasn't a cyber a attack. Kinetic yes, attack yes, per se, it, was it was a cyber, a cyber attack, attack. But but this is also. Uh, during this war, uh, we see the conventional war in Ukraine, but there's also a hybrid war, an information war, a cyber war going on, energy war going right. on. In 2007, we established this computer uh, emergency rescue team mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, is also helping uh, not only the government, but also the company, because uh, it is about the weakest link. And we are so connected, everybody, even, you know, hospitals. A few years ago, they only had to worry about some drug addict coming and right. stealing the morphine, now they are a security risk because if they are cyber attacked, uh, you know, there could be civilian casualties. And when companies are cyber attacked, they feel ashamed, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, we let our guard down and right. we didn't, I mean, and it went through and we paid ransom or, or, or something like that. And they don't talk about this. Right. Uh, but the good guys should share information because the bad guys do share information. Right. So in order to prepare uh, for future cyber attacks, we have to share this information if something happens. Yeah. Because then others can build on that experience and uh, build their resilience on it. Uh, and, and this is extremely, extremely important. That's super interesting, of course. A firm believes that being cyber attacked is a bad thing. They will really do the minimal reporting they need. Exactly, exactly. Which then makes the next cyber attack more, more likely. And more likely and, and uh, other companies more vulnerable. And why we have this uh, computer emergency uh, rescue team that is now also helping the companies to find their vulnerable uh, right. places. It's not anymore that, you know, the security of a country only depends on on uh, on government. It's it's also the private companies. And I think what is also maybe uh, different here 
is that our people um, trust uh, government and government services regarding uh, digital mm. um, issues, whereas uh, uh, maybe not so much the private companies. Right. Uh, whereas in some other co uh, countries, it's more like people give away a lot to the private okay. companies yeah. and there's like, oh, I'm not giving it to the state. Uh, but I think... Um, what is important that I've always stressed is, uh, is the digital uh, identities. I mean, mm -hmm. in the real world, uh, country issues a passport. You right. are who right. you say you are. Absolutely. Uh, in the online world, it is not always the countries. On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Exactly, famous, exactly. It's famous my famous, point, yeah. uh, famous cartoon. It's <laughs> yeah, like, that's right. Uh, the power of internet is that nobody yeah. knows you're a dog. Yeah. Well, the digital uh, identity solved that issue. Mm. Um, and that's why we have that. And you have to use this digital identity and, and, you, can ex and you can really mm. be sure that you are who you say you are. Not that, are you 18? Check the box, yes, I'm 18. The first time I came to Estonia more than 20 years ago, it was to come and look at some private companies. I saw a company called Privador uh, out of the University of Tartu. It's now known as Guards Time, mm -hmm. which is quite a successful uh, security and encryption mm -hmm. company. And of course, you had the tremendous success with Skype and Skype gave uh, birth to a, a new ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, and uh, companies like TransferWise known as Wise and Bolt and Pipedrive and Pactum and Starship, which makes little robots uh, uh, that, that deliver, deliver food. Here I host every year the student companies. And what is interesting about this is that our market is so small that all the students think about the global problems that they want to solve. Right. And that's why we have uh, most startups per capita and, and a lot of uh, good ideas. That well, most startups push. per capita, I think amongst the highest venture capital per, per capita, so the, the funds that are required to get these startups going. Um, but I was curious about why, why do you think Estonia has that special source? Is it about having to rebuild an economy because the, the Soviet Union hadn't left a robust mm. economy here? In the Soviet Union, you didn't have any private property, so you didn't have any market economy. When you haven't had those opportunities, you are so willing to use those opportunities that unfold. Yeah. Uh, so that is the first thing. The second thing is the education, definitely. Uh, so trying to focus on, on STEM subjects and everything. You said we had no market economy, and that's very hard for many of us to, to understand. So, so what, what does that mean? The civil code of, uh, of Estonia was uh, really, really uh, small because right. it didn't have a lot of paragraphs, because you didn't have any property to... Uh, to so you didn't need any laws to, to explain them, right? And you yeah. didn't really have all those uh, uh, agreements and everything had to be uh, built from scratch. And so first thing we understood uh, back then was that what makes investors trust your country is the uh, uh, rule of law. So building the laws and the legal system uh, was very important in order to attract investments and also keeping that uh, and getting rid of uh, corruption. And I started in a law firm when I was 18, giving advice <laughs> because the clients were young, the right. market was young, the right. laws were young, a lot of things were f forgiven. And I think this mentality has remained, you know, the startup mentality that also for the government, so that is okay uh, to fail because you learn something on the way and you can, you know, rebuild on that. If I sum up what this, this journey looks like, um, there is a sense of, of nationhood that delivers uh, a national resilience. And that resilience comes from having not had freedom, perhaps, and then having freedom and understanding its value, uh, living next to a threat, which leads to also to the development of the framework for opportunity, right? You, you build these new laws, these institutions that enable a democratic and market economy connected to a strong education system that had, you know, a focus on STEM. And, and then perhaps a, a little bit of good fortune that this happens around the time the digital revolution is taking place. We introduced the digital identities already in 2000, when I, many didn't have internet. 
that is also the leadership from the government side uh, because people didn't know that they need digital right. identities. But but building the framework and, and starting to build the CE governance and also the data that uh, uh, you you get from this and, and making it open uh, to the, the companies and, and using that, uh, I think was one of the fundamentals. Being a small nation, uh, by being digital, you can be much bigger. Uh, we have the e residence program, yeah. uh, and we are having all the services that, that we can the, use. The e residency program is so clever. It allows someone who's not an Estonian citizen to get an e residency in Estonia so they can start to build a business that can work in the digital marketplace but have the benefits of. Uh, you know, Estonia's relationships within the EU and Estonia's mm. legal system, even if they don't necessarily come physically, <laughs> physically come. Be here. I mean, what's that actually done for for Estonia? So that also means uh, the uh, tax uh, money eventually, and it also means that you have a lot of friends around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Brexit happened, we had a lot of uh, e-residents oh, coming. Many of my friends from, from yeah. UK. Yes, it's right. like, okay, how can we still enjoy uh, the the um, uh, European Union uh, and everything uh, that is uh, related to it? I think. Uh, what we have understood uh, since 2000s is that people are more and more living their lives online. Right. So the government also has to be there with the services. Otherwise, uh, the people just alienate from the state because I can do everything online. The only uh, establishment or institution that I can't uh, deal with is my government. <laughs> And I think the government should be where the people are. Right. Uh, but that requires the identities, and we could solve so many issues with this. There's something else, though, that I found really fascinating. As a government, you're only allowed to ask a citizen once for their information. And so every department has to use the information the government already has. Whereas if you're in the United States or in the UK and you're trying to do something with a different government department, mm. you're in there typing in the same information time mm. and time again. Is that a cultural trope? Is that a design decision? Was there some somebody who thought this is really important for us to get a, you know, legitimacy? Uh, it's all about customer experience, really. We don't use the plastics for the uh, uh, your driver's license anymore. Right. So you don't know when it's going to expire, really, because you don't really use it as, as such. So my state uh, writes me an email, uh, your driver's license is expiring. You have two choices, either to go to an office, it, pay, uh, it costs you more, or to do it online. Uh, you have to get your uh, doctor's uh, um, uh, approval that you can still drive a car and is this uh, still your signature we have this is still your address is that the picture we can use we have that picture of you yes check 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 and it's done and now we are trying to do uh, like more of this personalized event-based uh, uh, services so that for example your kid is born so the government says that okay you can register here you can do this you have to do this and right. so you don't have to think that what what else do I have to do? Because you're the first time parent and you don't really know. You don't have a lot of headspace, yeah. to be honest, when you're <laughs> that the first is time true. parent either. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah. Yeah. But technology is changing constantly. I mean, it's changing exponentially. Uh, and we, in the last you know, five, ten years, have seen this incredible transformation through artificial intelligence and many, many new risks mm -hmm. emerging from it. So w what do you do as a forward-looking government in terms of addressing the, the, the risks of, of AI, the questions that need mm. to be asked, asked of it? We see this on the European level, that we could use or, or diminish the administrative burden by, by using the AI. So you see there's an efficiency yes, opportunity. Yes, absolutely. But there's still this problem of yeah. the idea of the black box, the yeah. idea that there's some creature that is making decisions about my life that I can't perhaps inspect. We can't pretend that this uh, is not coming, uh, so we are ignoring this. Uh, uh, no, we don't do that. But at the same time, we are very co 
cautious of over-regulating because if you start to regulate in a very early phase, then you focus on the incumbents because this is what you know. And, oh, okay, this way it operates. But every time you focus on the incumbent, you actually make the rules that are made for the incumbent and not for everybody else. Yes. So, so the balance question is about the, you know how to uh, not kill innovation at the same time addressing the risks that there are. Um, I think that very often uh, on Do the European... you Europe think the EU has got this exactly, right with AI? Uh, exactly, that I wanted to uh, point oh. out that European Union is focusing, uh, trying to get all the risks. Right. Uh, and I think uh, that is not finding and striking the right balance right. Uh, regarding this. So I think it needs more of um, still this uh, startup mentality that, uh, of course, a co cooperation with uh, companies that are working on the AI, uh, but also uh, going um, to, to find this, this balance in between so that you don't uh, kill the innovation on the way. Uh, and it is difficult, I, I, I must say. In our government, we try to find ways we can use the AI, and we have over 100 user cases already where we use that. The premise of our conversation was that as we move into these exponential times of radically changing technologies, that legitimacy, resilience, and engagement will be critical capabilities for, for governments, and that digital capabilities are the ones that will allow that to happen. You know, to what extent do you think that these are lessons that can be learned and should be learned by other countries, in particular larger countries? Well, there are many lessons uh, uh, on the way. And I, I always say that when we have tested something, you know, it's like a beta version before you go online uh, right. in a bigger scale. We have tested right. this. Right, so and Estonia thought, is yes, the beta test market. Yes, yeah. exactly. So we have tested that and these are the bugs. <laughs> so we have tried to show other countries uh, what is our experience regarding this. But uh, I think we have to um, uh, cooperate. And I see that uh, there is a difference of mindset. I mean, I bring you one example. Um, we had a debate on the European level and the representative of one country uh, said to, to something that we were doing, it's like, oh my God, you're doing this and this is the most sensitive data there is. And I replied that it's also the data that helps the people the most. So it depends how you see it. Do you only see the risks or you also see the opportunities that there are? And of course, you can't overlook the risks. Uh, I, 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 I'm not uh, anyway uh, proposing that, but you have to see the opportunities. Again, if the private companies are driving this, uh, then the governments are left behind. And if the tools are there, you can't, you know, out-regulate them uh, because that's, they are already there. It's like the industrial revolution, you know. You can't say that you can't use the uh, mm -hmm. shoeing machine when right. it has been invented. Right. You have to think about what comes with it. Reflecting on my conversation with the Prime Minister, I'm struck by a few things. She really gets digital. She understands what government apps should look like and what citizens need from them. But she also raised the importance of values, the values of public-private cooperation, the values of alliances, and the values of protecting democracy. Perhaps because the memory of oppression is still so recent in Estonian memory. But I think these are all great lessons for bigger countries as well. I'm Azim Azar, and you've been watching exponentially.